Hey folks, welcome back. Dr. Nicole Truesdale here as always. I'm your host and guide for this podcast, Abolitionist Dreamscape. So welcome. Okay, y'all, we're episode 14 and today I got a treat for y'all. Now, if you follow me on TikTok or IG, you may have seen this post I did a few weeks ago in which I talked about having this gay curriculum. I got some friends in my life who, after I came out and finally opened up about how I was feeling like I was losing my goddamn mind because my body was coming alive, but I had no idea how to work with these emotions because I was feeling like I was 15, but I'm 42. I got a kid, but yet I'm feeling like a kid. Like what the hell was going on? And my friend Tina was like, girl, that's normal. You, you, you a baby gay, <laughs> right? You're coming out and coming into yourself, but it's colliding with the kind of age you have as, as being older and being a mom and that kind of stuff. So she was like, this is, this is kind of normal. So let me make you a curriculum, right? So that's where the gay curriculum came out of. And so when I talked about that on the video, a lot of folks were like, well, what's on it? <laughs> that sounds great. Can you talk about that some more? And that's where this episode comes from. So I'm going to turn it over to the interview that I did with uh, Tina and her fiance, Krista, in which they talk about their own coming out process, the kind of archives and memory making, and why music has been so vital for all of our kind of coming out processes, whether it be coming out into our sexuality, coming out into our gender expression, but also coming out to ourselves in the ways that we must come back into the body to do so, all right? So this is what the episode is going to be about. And just a couple of heads up. So this episode was about two hours long. I cut it down to an hour and some change. If you're on my Patreon, I will post post the whole um, interview up there. So you can go to my Patreon, subscribe, and you can hear the whole two hours. We had a lot of stuff we talked about um, that was really awesome. But for the purposes of the podcast, the first hour, uh, the very, very last bit of the conversation was really pertinent and cohesive. So the podcast will have the shortened version, which was just not that short. And if you want the longer version, head over to my Patreon, okay? Now, before we go to the interview, I want to do some housekeeping. So you can either jump ahead right now or you can stay and listen to different ways you can support my work, okay? So if you're here, thanks for staying. Now, as always, I have to say thank you. Thank you to all my supporters, those who show up and listen, like, share, comment, who are able to both monetarily and non-monetarily support. All of it really does help y'all. So if you are looking to monetarily support my work, there's a number of ways you can do so. I have a Patreon, Abolitionist Dreamscapes, a number of different tiers starting at $5 a month, all the way up to 100. Wherever you can support, it always is very helpful. That is a base for me to be able to create, to teach, to experiment. And um, I'm putting up various types of content um, on the Patreon from book reviews to lesson pl- lessons to talking about spirit and the human and the like. Okay. So you can check that out more on my Patreon. I've also got this podcast and a sub stack of the same name as well, Abolitionist Dreamscapes. So again, if you can't monetarily support, especially with my YouTube channel, if you, um, if you view, if you like, if you share those views, especially through YouTube will help me be able to monetize in the future and also um, gain sponsorship. So that's another way you can help support and spread my work. If you're interested in working directly with me, I do have a website, drnicoletruestell.com. There you can find different ways and services that I have. Through my Truesdell and Associates LLC, I do coaching and consulting, organizational and educational consulting for various organizations, along with executive coaching. And I'm also having a special program starting March 6th for Black women leaders that is called Believe Your Reality. It's a two-month program that kind of gives you a, a preview and a sample of how I do executive coaching and also consulting in a small cohort format. So over the course of three Zoom sessions, we're going to go through various topics like what does it mean to let go of the trope with a strong Black woman? What does it really do? What does it really mean to take back your time and understand the institution you're in? And then in in doing so, then how do you lead with grace and love of self by bringing in the concepts and the energies of grace and love that actually center self? And I do this through an abolitionist lens. So we talk about structure. We talk about the state. We also talk about you, your humanity and spirit all together. So if you're interested in that program, it's called Believe Your Reality. I start March 6th. It is a professional development program. So if you have if you have professional development funds, you can use that to pay for the service. And if you need more information about that, please go to my website, drnicoletruesdale.com. And I do have a free info session about this on May, on May, March 27th, excuse me, March 27th at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. I will be hosting a live um, or Zoom session, free info session if you want more information about it um, and to get a feel about how you will work with me. So more information about that will be seen um, in the show notes below, okay? And I 
think that's it. Be on the lookout, y'all. So June 2nd, if you're in the Chicagoland area, I am going to be doing my first in-person event, um, doing some experimentation with soundscapes, abolitionist soundscapes. So I'll have more information about that over the coming um coming weeks. I'll be working on that with a close friend, Forrest Brooks, um, who's also a sound producer. So I'm super excited about that at the Hunting Club Network up in the Humble Park in the West Side. So again, I'll have more information about that coming forward. Please follow me on my socials, TikTok, IG. Um, I am also on threads. I'm not really on there a whole lot, but all of my socials, including YouTube or at Dr. Nicole Truesdale. Okay, y'all. So I think that's all the housekeeping I have. Let's go to the interview. All right, y'all, we are at episode 14, episode 14, season two. I'm here, you're here, we're here together. Now, what I got today for you is a treat. I have two uh, special people in my life right now with me, joining me today all the way from, where are y'all joining me from? Tell, tell the people where y'all coming Raleigh, from. Raleigh, North Carolina. All right, we got Raleigh, North Carolina in the house, y'all. So if you follow me on TikTok, a couple of weeks ago, I made a video talking about a gay curriculum that one of my friends made. So oh, I'm late in life lesbian, came out at 40, broke my life, did all that good shit now. And now here I'm 42, gay as hell, living my life. <laughs> Part of me living my life and helping me do this, right, was... Um, having other folks who I was in community with, building community with, um, because I broke everything. I broke my life, I broke the community, and there was a way that he, who I related to in my past was not who I could relate to in my present. But I actually had folks in my present who saw me probably before I even saw myself, quite frankly. And so what I, what I have here today um, are, are is uh, Tina and Krista. So let me tell you who they are, and then we're going to go right into it, okay? So Tina, wait, wait, hi, Tina, just say hi. Also known as Dr. Artina Hamilton. I just got to put some respect on her name. All right, but here it is going to be Tina. Tina hails from Louisville, Kentucky, and is your soon-to-be favorite rich lesbian auntie. A double Scorpio with a dark and brooding mood and fierce loyalty to those she allows in her queendom. She lives life on her own terms. I know that's right. She's a pop, cult she's a pop culture enthusiast and an unflappable cynic. In her professional life, she manages crisis, curates inclusion, and holds court with her subjects. Yes, she does, y'all. Don't fuck with her at all. Okay, don't fuck with her. Now, joining with her is her lovely partner, Krista McQueenie, also known as Dr. Krista McQueenie. Put some respect on her name as well. But in this space, we're going to call her Krista. So Krista is a sociologist, mediator, grammar nerd, and Gemini with fairy energy and a lesbian auntie as well. We got two lesbian aunties for all y'all today, okay? She's an award-winning professor. I know that's right. A published writer, put some respect in her name, and a professional editor who loves to help people of all ages discover their passions and connect through writing. And she is currently working on a book about white womanhood, where she does the painful but necessary healing work of trying to unlearn white supremacy from the inside out. Go ahead, Krista. We all y'all got to do that work, right? This is what it means to do the work. <laughs> it's sitting in the uncomfortability. All right, y'all, welcome. So again, I, I brought my, my I brought them on the onto the um, podcast, y'all, because I want to talk about this idea of coming out. All right. And I wanted to talk about coming out with um, folks who have helped me come out um, and who have helped me understand and navigate this terrain. Because I might be 42, but sometimes I feel like I'm 10. Sometimes I feel like I'm 20. Sometimes I feel like I'm a 15 year old brooding and I gotta be, I'm texting Tina, like what the hell is going on? All I wanna do is scream and have sex and lay in the bed. <laughs> She's like, welcome to being a teenager. <laughs> So to help me out, uh, what Tina did was she started get, making me um, a gay syllabus, essentially. Like, what does it mean to come out? So she was like, girl, listen, you need to get your life together a little bit, but it's normal. <laughs> and so how do you get your life together a little bit? Is you got to realize that this is normal. So here, I'm going to give you a curriculum. Because again, we're all academics, right? We are all former academics, academics. So the curriculum made the most sense in all of our minds. So when Tina was like, I'm going to give you some, I'm going to give you some homework, right? That homework added it up over time to essentially what I call my get my coming out gay curriculum. Um, so <laughs> But a lot of folks were actually interested, Tina, about this. When I did the TikTok, a lot of folks were like, one, that was amazing. They thought that you were a very kind person and also loving. And I was like, yes, she is. Yes, she is. But also, too, people were like, I want, I want that as well. <laughs> Like, I need that in my life, <laughs> right? So can you talk with us about, like, where this idea came up? And also, quite frankly, your reaction when I told you that um, I realized that I, I was a lesbian. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll start with my reaction. Uh, I was like, I think internally something was like, maybe, possibly. 
You know what I mean? I remember you said a husband, but there's like a spirit thing. We talk about, was it Gadar, right? Yeah. That you know, sometimes we know before the person knows. So I was like, wow. But I also knew like, it's hard because you're at a certain age, you're very established, you have your friends, you're blowing your whole life up, right? And I think part of the syllabus was like, how do you navigate a space where there are no resources, specifically being black, right? There's something specific to being black. So for me, coming up with the syllabus, coming up with stuff was like survival guides because there's so many emotions. I think the thing I talk about is the second adolescence, right? So when we are dating men, if you're dating men, right? You know, people are socialized, you date, you get married, you have kids. And if you move into the life, which we'll talk about being LGBTQ, there's a way in which it's like, it's not always a continuity, right? Because I can't expect that she's going to do what this person did. Even if she looks kind of masculine, I can't make that assumption. So how do I navigate? But also the biggest part I was concerned for you was concerned for you, as we say, was the emotional piece, right? There's so much intensity and it is all happening and hormones and sex and uncertainty. And there is no person to talk to, right? When we have these breakdowns or we have these heartbreaks, it's, you can't explain it. So when I was trying to explain to my friends about my first, and I'm devastated, and I talked about this, I'm walking the streets of Atlanta, okay, with the Walkman, all right, and walk <laughs> streets of Atlanta. I had lost so much weight, girl, my clothes falling off because I was depressed. The first person I fell in love with, we had broke up, my life was over, and my friends are like, oh, it's okay. Girl, no, it's not. I'm dead. I am dead. So for me, it's part of warmth and just care and compassion saying, hey, you're going to go through these emotions and they're going to feel extreme and you're going to feel foolish. We talk about that, right? Because in your mind, like you said, I'm grown, I'm da 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 But no, like you're five years old. No. And this is like new sensations, not to mention, which I think you're still going through, when you realize that your how you show up in the world in a queer space is like some different shit. Right. So maybe over in this world, I was just OK, but here. So I think just like people need resources to navigate the emotions and also people need parents and aunts and uncles. Right. We have a gay daughter, Claire, yes. who I actually met online as well. You know, Claire's awesome. So I'm going to say what organization, but Claire, that's that's our daughter. She asks us for money. We take her shopping. It's real crazy. OK, <laughs> but people need that because. There is like, again, going back to drag houses, having those families is important. I think now, which we've talked about previously, everything is so commodified and, and all everyone matters that we don't think about the specifics. There's a specific care that you need as a baby gay that like you can't just go to the bookstore and find the book or talk to somebody about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the biggest thing. Like I didn't realize the emotions Right. Like, and I had just started working with my emotions more directly uh, when I left higher ed. That was the whole thing about the, the beginning of, I thought breaking my life meant leaving work. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, it's okay, it Chris, it's okay. <laughs> It'll be okay. But like when I left, right, it was all these emotions came out. So I thought that that was what I was missing was like, again, working with my anger and stuff. But no, it was literally once I realized I was gay and then had my first like intimate like the relationship with the woman, I was like, holy shit. Like, I, I know this doesn't make any sense. And I also know that like, I am being foolish, but I can't stop. Like I couldn't stop myself. Like I couldn't, like, it was insane. And I was like, what the hell is going on? And at the time I wasn't as open as well. Cause I thought I should figure it out. And yes. I remember a couple of times you I remember this because Tina, I met Tina um, because I initially was trying to hire her to work with me <laughs> at Brown a long time ago. This is a long time ago before the lockdowns and all that. Long story short, that 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 that's what blew up my whole career was trying to get her, uh, trying to have her have being hired or one of the candidates for the position, right? The kind of protest, all this other stuff. And so that kind of cut off um our ability to work together. But I realized, and we talked about this before, we're never supposed to work together like that. We were supposed to be, have the initial contact, the initial, the yes. initial connection. 
Yeah. Because Tina then came later on, what, a few months later was like, hey, can can we work together? And I was like, oh, okay. I, I thought you were going to hate me because I literally had to cancel. Like I had tickets ready. I think we bought your tickets and everything. It was two days before. Oh, that's right. It was two days before. Oh my God. It was two days before the interview. Oh my God. I forgot that. It was it was a mess, y'all. That's a whole other episode. But that was a fucking mess. So I was like, this woman's going to hate me, which I could understand, right? Like she didn't know me and then I canceled her interview. <laughs> And she's like, hi, can we still work together? I was like, oh, okay. But what I realized is after one of our after one of our meetings, you were like, are you okay? And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> you were like, well, there's a lot of emotions with this. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that's normal? Yeah. And I was so hesitant to tell you that I felt like I was going fucking crazy. <laughs> I'm like, I went on a date and it lasted five months. I was like, is this normal? Yeah. And so when you gave me the, started giving me things to like watch. And so the curriculum, y'all, was really a lot. Nothing was reading. It was really a lot of watching things. Like it was movies. It was series. Music. It was music. Yeah. And I love me some music. If you follow me, I know I love some music. And, but when you had me watch the L word when I, this year when I was sick. Yes, I was, I was light out, y'all, for the beginning of the year. Um, and so Tina's like, sit your ass down, go to bed, and watch the L word. And I would, I watched all six seasons, y'all, like in a week. Like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I would be texting Tina, and then I would get voice notes back from Krista and Tina with like these basically like mini podcasts of like breaking shit down and being like, yes, and talking yeah. about how that was early 2000 gays and thinking about 2024. And it was interesting because I was realizing as we, as I was talking with y'all and you were like kind of uh, podcasting and talking with each other back to me, you both were remembering your own coming out processes in mm-hmm. a very like different, but also interesting way. So it was also like, I was getting the, honestly, the, pl- the, the pleasure, but also the privilege to hear older queer folks who I also respected really be very vulnerable and intimate and realize and almost like reprocess your own coming out stories. So Mm -hmm. how was that for you when y'all were doing it? Because like, and it was funny because you could also hear the love between you two when you were doing Mm -hmm. it as well, because you had different types of stories. Because obviously, Tina, you black, Krista, you white, and it's a whole different way that that then engages and influences how you you show up in queer spaces, right? But when y'all were talking together, I don't know, y'all. It was like this, I could almost hear and feel the 90s and 2000s in a way that I hadn't done in so long, but through a queer lens, it was so different. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot about, you know, what what you guys are highlighting is like that we all need roadmaps. We all need Mm -hmm. mentors. And I felt really lost when I came out. I mean, it's like all the structure, all the rules that you grew up with, all the conditioning, you kind of have to throw it out the window, but what do you replace it with? Mm -hmm. And so uh, for me, you know, I I grew up as an athlete. I I think I grew up Catholic. I grew up in New England in this very, you know, community that thought of itself as liberal, but was very into normalcy and not being... Um, an outsider, you know, fitting in, not doing things differently. So for me to decide or to acknowledge and really come to terms with the fact I was gay was kind of earth shattering. I, I remember sitting on my bed, you know, as a teenager, thinking about girls on my basketball team that I had crushes on and just crying and knowing that I could never tell anybody praying to God that he would take, you know, that God would take my feelings away, reading the Bible. There was a lot of like suppression happening. Um, And I also just felt lost because I didn't know gay people. I didn't know what I was supposed to do to, you know, like, even Mm -hmm. if I would come out to myself, what do you do then? Where do you go? Yeah. And so um, I think that that was a lot of why I continued to really throw myself into sports was that I knew that was a legible avenue for me to be gay and for me to, you know, like have other gay friends. And maybe I had a dream about myself being a basketball coach and someday I would have a partner who was another basketball coach. You know, that was like, that was my goal for my life because that was all I knew. That was all I saw. 
And uh, so, and I also went to a women's college because deep in my heart, I knew that I, or I thought that I would be embraced into a sisterhood, mm -hmm. that if I came out, I would be safe there. Um, and again, it's this kind of like, I was looking for a roadmap. I was looking for things to keep me safe, to help me, you know, have a mentor. And, and you guys just spoke to that beautifully. And just, um, we need that throughout our entire lives. So it was, but so you were looking for something that would demonize it, right? So when you saw the L word, like, did you see yourself in it? No, <laughs> not at all. Okay. <laughs> not at first. Because it's funny. So Krista watched a little bit when she was like coming out, I guess, right? It, in the early 2000s, it was something that my queer friends would have little t parties on Sunday nights and we would watch the L word together. But I was in, you know, I was just starting grad school in sociology. I thought, oh, this shit is so commodified. I'm not going to watch the L word. It's like these skinny white girls, you know, <laughs> why would I want to be involved with that? So, so you couldn't relate to it. I did not really relate to it. But I, you, you, know, but you saw it differently. It from really wasn't it. until I watched it again with you that I was like, oh, there are a lot of stories here that I do connect with. But I had to get past the, you know, just my ick factor of like the whiteness. Yes. The, the whiteness, the, 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 the hetero, it, even though they were queer, it was the heteronormativity of it all. And, but I think for you as a white feminist, it was that their femme legibility was a lot for you. It mm. felt like it was too glamorous. Cause we talked about that, like the, the differences in legibility aesthetics, right? When we were coming out, aesthetics was a big thing. You know, I would say in black community, a lot of roles, I would say in your white feminist world, it was about not having roles. It was about being, you know, granola. You know what I do. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, you know what I'm saying? So did you, so when you saw the L words, you're like, this is, this is not it. Well, yeah, it was not feminist in my conception of what feminism was at the time. Because, yeah, we were trying to break free of all the heteronormativity, the gender roles, marriage, all that stuff that so is what sort is, of... What is, feminist, what is feminist to you at that point? I mean, at feminist? that point, um, it was... Well, yeah, I mean, I was I was learning a lot about the invisible structures that condition us and, and, and restrain us as a sociologist. So it was, you know, really the focus was on breaking free of those structures, breaking free of those systems. And, you know, I did it better and worse throughout my, you know, early adulthood. Sometimes I really sucked at it. So cer certainly I'm not, you know, like being like, hey, I was so radical. But um, I think feminist was breaking free of the roles. You're right. It was giving up joy, trying to giving up joy, right. not paying as much attention to what I looked like because people should accept me for my you know, for who I am, like for my whole self, for my brains, for my intellect, um, for, for, for being different. And that was, you know, something I was really trying to step into because that had not been my experience growing up where that was embraced. It was, oh, you have to be normal. You have to fit in. So I was trying to break free of a lot of that systemic oppression as I saw it. And, and the, what I was seeing on TV was not it. <laughs> I was not breaking free. <laughs> But I found that, like, for me, as a Black woman from the South, as I like to say, in Atlanta, surrounded by all the Black lesbians, mm -hmm. like, I still like the L word. It was white, but I also recognized that representation was important. But then also as someone who was, you know, I, I think I, I mentioned before, I was a little more tomboys when I was dating dudes, but with women, I was a little more feminine. Seeing other representations was so important to me. Mm -hmm. And to not, because that was my nightmare you know the granola lesbians that be out here you know with crystal deodorant like growing up in kentucky the clubs i went to that's what i saw i saw mm -hmm. those break the system but when i went to atlanta it was the lisa bonet michelle obama it was like beyonce lesbians it was like alice walk lesbians it was so diverse yeah. in it so the l word was like an extension of that for okay. me and also, you know, the class piece, I think, is really interesting. So when we watched it again, I think we were reliving, but also I helped you see the nuances because I think Krista's socialization into lesbian feminism, that really shaped how you looked at coming out and looked at community, wouldn't you say? Yeah, for sure. You know, 
I mean, the, even though I was lost, felt lost and was seeking a roadmap, I, what I was finding was still very restrictive. It was immediately when you come out, you have to cut your hair. Can't listen to rap anymore. Can't listen to rap anymore. I had a lot of people at Wellesley that were like, Dana, why are you so misogynist? You're bringing your, you know, your rap music with you, your gangster rap. And they, they made fun of me and brought it out into the common room, <laughs> played it for everybody. And it was like, you know, uh, which... <laughs> They took your music from you, literally. They, yeah, yeah. Took her yeah. swag from her. There was a lot of joy that got lost in that process. And, you know, I, I'm not knocking. Feminism saved me in a lot of ways, as well as, like, social justice, period. Mm -hmm. But um, I do recognize now that there were a lot of ways that it was a lot more constricting than, uh, than freeing. Just real quick, my feminism had room for strippers, okay? Because I was at Pride, at Black Gay Pride, and the strippers were dancing. My stripper, it, it, the, it's nuanced. And that was the thing for me. And the Black, again, that, that tradition we lose is that we were women, because we still got to go to mama and aunties. We're still going to be in community. And I think that's the biggest thing, is that I feel like I could still be the pieces of myself because you've heard my playlist, listen to a lot of massages music, but I still want to do it. I felt like with the way that you described it, you gained the sisterhood of the traveling lesbian pants, <laughs> but there's just a lot of joy, yeah. you know, like I would say in her lesbian life, they couldn't get live dances in her lesbian stuff. But in my lesbian world and cartographies, we could. You but see, this is really them. interesting. Mm -hmm. But y'all are y'all are hitting on something that is really prevalent to this present day, right? That is so that is like in our faces right now. Is when we people talk about intersectionality. This is why I hate people. I'm an intersectional person. No, you're not. You're a damn person who has a bunch of shit put upon you. But what y'all are describing is the ways of the structures themselves and how when they collide, one will always consume while the other one will always um, have a relationship with. So when whiteness of the institution met queerness through Krista's body, you had to fit another box. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Because whiteness yeah, will always, good. whiteness needs order. But the order has to be binary. It has to be restricted. This is why you can be gay and not be queer, right? We look, like just because you're queer doesn't mean, just gay doesn't mean you're queer. Like you can still buy into heteronormativity in some ways. That's right. But with Chris, I mean, with Tina, what you're talking about, what I'm hearing is like, but this is what happens when queerness and blackness collide. Blackness is not trying to consume queerness. They can sit side by side, right? Absolutely. Because they, they're interrelated. And if people are going to get pissed off, yes, y'all, blackness and queerness are interrelated, all right? This is not about some patriarchal bullshit. When you bring this idea of an alpha in, all you're doing is bringing whiteness in again, right? There's another patriarchal whiteness in again. So I think this is really interesting because Krista, can you talk a little bit more than, I'm fascinated by this, I'm not going to lie, but Krista, then how has, but you're not the same person now that you were then, right? So, because right. you just called yourself a fairy in your bio, right? <laughs> <laughs> which I find really, like, I love, right? I love that. So how did you go from that restriction to now being a fairy? <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's been a long ass process. Let me tell you, it's a journey. Um. Yeah, I think that what I learned as a gay person, a lot of that had to be thrown out the window mm -hmm. when I met Tina. Um, I think with my, you know, dating other black women has been incredibly freeing for me. I think that there's been more of a focus on being free, getting free than I ever found with dating white women. And bringing back the joy, bringing back. Oh, I gotta stop I, I think that I was. So, I, I do think that was you were you. You've been a big part of it. But what are you saying? Because are you saying that like you said, dating white women, black women gave you joy. Well, but are you modeled that it was okay to have joy and that it was good to have joy? In what way? Um, like I don't have to be so restricted and confined to the normal ways of doing things, even if the normal is now hetero, you know, it's a homonormative. Uh, I, I can just allow the parts of me that are untapped and that are unspoken and unexpressed to come out. I don't have to play by the rules in order to have a good life. I can allow myself to just make mistakes, trip up, 
be imperfect and but was that was that really dating other women or was it me though it was you it was, was you specific. okay yeah I would, I mean, get, just getting back to the intersection. Oh, Tina's a Scorpio rising and yes. Krista's a Sag rising. You, you were going to see this throughout this conversation. Keep going, please. <laughs> You're right, though, baby. I mean, it, it a lot of it was and has been you. Um, but, why? but getting back to the intersectionality mm-hmm. piece or the, the cultural differences, I do, I do associate it, too, with just um, that white. I had to try to unlearn a lot of whiteness. And I'm still, oh, and always will be in the process of, of doing that. But what I guess I'm trying to say is, like, obviously, like, your ex-wife was Black, but it, I'm different, you know? So, yeah. like, what was it about me that helped you? Because I do feel like you've grown, even in this couple years I've known you. Mm-hmm. Like, you keep pushing yourself. So, what is it about me that helps you get there? Um, I mean, I think from day one, you've always been like, I see something in you. Something. And you've been really amazing at pulling it out. It's not that I'm becoming a different person. It really feels like this more organic, like freeing where I'm releasing something that was already there and learning to embrace and express it. Um, And you've just from day one encouraged me to do that. Um, Both aesthetically in terms of my appearance and how I carry myself, how I dress my hairstyle. Those are not things that I was taught or encouraged to pay a lot of attention to as a, a white lesbian coming up. And, you know, as a tomboy, and it was like, I never wore makeup, um, none of that stuff. And I'm still very low key, but yeah, I think you, you also ex- encouraged me to, um, to develop those inner personality traits that you saw in me and that, uh, and that the things that I had given up, like, Oh, you know, you had swag before you came out and before you went to Wellesley and they taught you to be like, you know, a little miss proper, a little miss proper, but yeah. Let, let me tell you, like, this example, when we met, okay, so, you know, for people that are watching this, Krista is the first person of non-melanin that I've dated. <laughs> and so, you know, when we met, I was like, you know, I said I would be open because I was praying to my people. I said, listen, you know what? I'm making the same decision, so help me. So Do something new. Do something new, so, literally. So, Krista, you sent me a message, and I was sick. We were talking in the, oh, yeah. in the chat back yeah. and forth. Yeah. And she said, I'm going to send you a song that makes me feel better. And I had looked at our pictures, and I said, what song make me feel better? Indigo Girls? Yeah, this is going to be some Indigo Reba Girls. Reba McIntyre. What, what you going to send me? What you going to play for me? Okay. <laughs> Brandy Carlisle. Brandy Carlisle. <laughs> right. Baby, she hit me with the Jill Scott, and it wasn't no mainstream Jill Scott. I said, what? I said, go look at the pictures again. I said, hold up. <laughs> I'm confused. What? <laughs> Something does not match you. So we was talking, and I was like, oh, and then she was sending me playlists with, because I'm a big music person, all this music. And it was not the white entry point. It was like, oh, this is in her, and stuff she's talking about. And I was like, I was like, I know I said ancestors, I want to be open, but I don't know if I want to be this open. I don't know if I, but I was like, wow. Cause I was able to see the, the complexity. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I saw something else in you. And that's what wasn't making sense because how you were showing up. Cause you were very uh, meekish, very mousy. It just, where well, you were, you were, you were like, you're amazing. But I was like something adding up and that's what it was. We're not going to say your school, but that's what it was. It yeah. was that you part of, I love what you said, Nicole, whiteness required that you give up all those things. Yeah. And you were told to be here. You cannot be in this way. Right. Yeah. And I also saw you freeing yourself throughout the years we've been together. You have not only encouraged me to express who I am and those inner parts that got lost, but I have seen you doing that. I have seen you leaving institutions that did not serve you. I have seen you really struggle to figure out how to have self-care and boundaries that are healthy for you with your family, with your career, with friends. Like all of that has been incredibly important for me to just walk that walk with you and see you in action. 
because you don't just talk the talk. You you do walk the walk. And I think people, that's part of why you're such a great and inspiring mentor is that you're just who you are. You just live, you've been living your life, life is life. And then Tina's out here showing what is possible. But I think it's hard though. Like we talk about this idea of coming out, right? So I feel like I got to come out every five, seven years, you know? Um, I've been queer my whole life, right? So queer in the idea of being othered, going to a magnet school, playing an orchestra, being a poet, all this other stuff, going to HBCU, but then also being defined as a radical, you know, eccentric person. Militant. Militant, being gay, then being a lesbian and being verse. Because listen, I'm not getting to that, but me too. Okay, me too. <laughs> so all these things. And then when I met you, it's like, damn, now I'm with a white woman. You know what I mean? And it's just like, but I think that has helped me. Like um, the the fighting for freedom, it just makes it easier for me to live my yeah. life. Like, you know, the thing we talked about leaving academia and what that meant, because that, that was hard. That was hard because I had to come out in a whole nother way. And also I think the thing is when you're coming out in any environment is, so what does this mean? Who am I? What do yeah. I bring with me and what do I keep? Yeah. Yeah. Because you don't realize how much, at least I didn't realize how much of my identity I had tied up into the institution and into Absolutely. being the academic, right? And you, and you, and you, and think about it, all of us do um, various types of work of deconstruction of oppressive systems, right? Deconstructing and, and, and pushing through what is to get to something new. But yet we forget that we're still in the midst of the belly of the beast. So then it, it, it does... In, it does literally seep into us and it becomes a part of who we think we are. And when we remove ourselves from it, we don't realize just how attached we were to a space in a place that we both didn't really like, but also and took from us and we knew it, but then we had no idea we inadvertently gave love to, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I think about that a lot. Like I inadvertently gave love to a space that I knew could not love back. But when I, but when I chose to, it's like a breakup, right? When I chose to break up with that, with that space, the heartache was insane. But then what cracked open was a whole new way of life, like a whole new possibility then, right? You didn't realize, I didn't realize how much that was taking up so much space and how, who I thought I was and how I saw myself that very similar to Krista, like, I'll be honest, I realized that that is what allowed me to be okay having my joy stolen. Cause I, I was miserable in higher ed for 10 years. Like it was like nonstop fighting. I felt like, and I thought that that was my role and job. Right. Like, and then being a Scorpio rising, right. You kind of go into these brooding moments of like, well, you know, everyone's going to betray me. So fuck it. I'll just go and do everything myself and I'll show you just how good I am. That's a trap because all we do is give up more of our shit and then get tired and burnt out. And then we literally like socially die. <laughs> right. Um, and so when when I when I cut that off and had that heartbreak and opened up and then this kind of space came out to open up, right? I found it funny because y'all talk about music and how music helped you see Krista. And then Krista, you know, the music also is a space that y'all can connect with. Music is what helped me as well when I was doing the breakup with higher ed and then coming into and realizing I was gay. It was music that helped me um, go through that. And then one of the first things I listened to before you gave me, um, the music curriculum, Tina, <laughs> was Charlotte Day Wilson's I'll Take Care of You. But you know what's so funny? I was listening to the remix of that song and, and, and Michelle Neglicello's actually on it. I didn't realize oh. that. Like I've been, so the very first song that I was really listening to on repeat to try to like, just like get into a kind of care mode because I had broken up with my husband, right? Like I, I was, I was separated from everything and I didn't realize that Charlotte was gay. So I was listening to the song and finally one day I was like, is this woman gay? <laughs> very, very, very gay, very queer <laughs> artist. <laughs> but from there it like opened up and all of the songs that I was listening to, all of the songs that came my way. And then when you told me to listen to Michelle Nicolicello's whole like discography, mm -hmm. right? It was like the goddamn seas parted. And for the first time in my life, I realized like, this is what I mean when I say what love is. 
Like it was crazy. Mm-hmm. Like it finally, I finally felt like I had music and lyrics and song and sensuality unapologetically in a in a storytelling format because Comfort Woman is is an amazing album yes. start of love, right? Yes. And when you listen to it after Bitter and then um then what is it, cookies? It's almost like you're seeing the evolution of heartbreak into love again. Like Absolutely. love is all possible, right? Yeah. And I needed that. Like, it was mm-hmm. like telling a story that I didn't know I needed, but the only way it could be told that I could hear it was through music. And I think that it's like a beautiful format that connects us back to spirit and it has us understand like that we have to be connected to one another. And so what does connection look like when we get past the superficial? I think that's what the music comes in. And like, it gives you, allows you to see, see yourself and see one another. So I think it's really interesting that it was music that got you to look past the performance of identity that you both were doing to get into the the humanity of what you each needed from one another. Is, is that fair to say? Yeah. So that was one of our first sources of connection was music. And we, we, we communicated, we had a special language through music that was, that transcended our bodies and our, you know, yeah, it was, it felt spiritual. And I think what you said, I mean, cause you know, that's one of the things you told me to do for higher ed, like make a playlist mm-hmm. and, you know, even now it hurts. It hurts, you know, like I, it ran parallel my last relationship, but also like all the dreams and aspirations. And also my, dis- both our dissertations was on queer community. So there's a lot of pieces that are wrapped up in that. Right. And I think that for me, um, the music just provided me another citation, another entry point to kind of think about what it felt like. Cause I think that was also a grief. Actually, now I think about it, yeah, it's all connected, but I think it's a deeper grief for me is that my leaving the academy and my leaving Atlanta, all those things were wrapped up together, right? Mm-hmm. So I've talked about how influential Atlanta was. Um, I began visiting Atlanta when I was high school in the 1900s, as kids say, and then, you know, I moved there early 2000, um, but was doing road trips even in undergrad, like all night road trips to go there. Like it shaped me is where I came out. It's where I like to say I was raised. There's a certain aesthetic, right? There's a certain, I had a liberal rites of passage. And for me, I think leaving the institution, it maps with that because I felt my most freest, uh, blackest, gayest, lesbian poet. I felt my most heightened self when I was in Atlanta at that time. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, the music, uh, which also goes into the curriculum, it's also those memories. It's like stepping back in a time machine. We were watching Sanjay and Apparel last night, right? And that's a great example, like stepping back in a time machine. That's what music feels like. It reminds me, I knew where I was at. I knew what Mm -hmm. club I was at and all those things. Yeah, yeah, from Black Mirror. Yeah. good episode. Oh my God. It is, uh, oh yeah, you gotta check that out. It's on your gay curriculum this week. Absolutely. <laughs> what is it again? San Apero on Black Mirror. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's so good. So good. Like, amazing. Like, oh, cry. Uh, um, yeah, I lost my train of thought there, but... Music. You, yeah, music. Well, I think that music for me, like, a lot of my growing up was dissociating from my emotions, dissociating from my body. As an athlete, you just keep going. You just man up quote unquote, you, you know, you, you play through the pain. Um, and I also came from a Irish Catholic family that was just like working all the freaking time. The work ethic was unbelievable. And both of my parents are now, you know, have worked really hard and sacrificed for us. My father passed away, uh, this past fall, but have not really been able to enjoy their life as an, as older people, the re- the retirement phase when you're supposed to be you know, like being yourself and enjoying life. They're both having, you know, they just have worked themselves into a point where they don't have uh, basic ability to be mobile and, you know, kind of like go out in the world and, and function. So, so seeing that uh, has been very eye opening and and also other things that have happened in my life, but music helped me to come back to the emotions of it all and to stop dissociating. If I'm feeling apart from my body, the best thing for me to do is listen to some music. But also I would say 
you know, I have Scorpio music. So the thing Chris will tell you is when I met her, I have these playlists of of just uh, torment songs. What would you call them? Yeah, Scorpio songs. <laughs> you know, like torment, like full of me, torch songs. And I'm listening, I go into a dark room and I just, it like makes me so better. better. You fall out on the floor. Yes. And it's like, ah! Yes. You know, you, you revel in the pain of it all. Yes. Because again, for me, and also I'm a poet too. I think for me, I, I know what you're talking about, Nicole. I know what's like, Michelle, there's songs where you can taste the love and you can mm. feel it. And you're like, this is what I want, right? Yes. And I think that's the thing with music and we share it. I was like, this is what I want. This is what I feel. And that she could transmute that, you know, transmute that to me. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, music just provided. Also, it's kind of like a mutual understanding that you get it. You know what love feels like? Because I think the thing that going back to this bar discussion about LGBT, queer, et cetera, like it feels like love and romance is gone away. You know, like when we were coming out, there was the fear, okay? The fear that you would be outed. It mm -hmm. was very scary, but I also mm -hmm. kind of liked it. It was a little sneaking around. It was kind of enjoyable, right? <laughs> Dangerous. Dangerous. But also like the love, the emotion, um, the the luring. Like, the intensity. The intensity it. of it. And, you know, some of the songs I sent you, some of the music is like, especially with Michelle, like, um, Full of Me, that album, that was literally doing my breakup. So, you know, that was like a theme. I just stopped crying like when I met Krista with Full of Me, okay? Like, it took a long time. Yeah. But like, Love Song 1 and 2, like, this is how it me. feels. Yeah, I do, I do. <laughs> but like, the feeling of love and the intensity that we feel in these same gender relationships is reflected in that. Mm -hmm. And if somebody can express it, it, it's just like a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yes. And I don't, then I don't feel crazy, honestly, like yeah. Yeah. listening and maybe not feel crazy because, and I talked about this with you a lot. Like I didn't realize how much I love love. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I had no idea how Venetian I really was until I broke out of, out of all that, all those institutions. Right. Because there's no space to really express and hold it, especially when you don't look like what we are told a uh, feminine woman supposed to look like, right? Who can, yes. who can portray that, right? And so like, I never wore uh, colors like pink or purple or anything that considered that was considered like girl, quote unquote girly, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't do that because I wanted to be taken seriously, right? I, I was in, you know, I was younger in the places I was in in higher ed, first gen, all those, all those tropes that were told when you're first gen, when you're low income, when you, when you black, when you were woman, I mean, all these things, you don't realize that you, actually inadvertently believe them. And so that's what's the trap because it gets you to like, you, Krista, you were saying earlier, cut yourself off, right? And so I, for so long, and I was also an ex-athlete, college athlete, right? After college, I did CrossFit, which y'all don't do CrossFit. That's some, that's some, that's I've some, done it, yeah. that's some crazy shit, right? Yeah. I was doing kettlebell training. I was learning kettlebells from a woman who learned from the Russians, right? It was ridiculous. Wow. <laughs> I got stories in a half marathon, like all kinds of shit, right? Beating the shit out of my body because it was another form of disassociation, right? Because I didn't, it was like, I felt, I'll be mm -hmm. honest, y'all, if I, if I would have felt, because there was moments I did feel in my thirties, I knew good and damn well that I was in a marriage that, I, that, that was not for me. I knew that I was in an institution. Like every time I allowed myself to truly feel and that Scorpio came out and that I, I love me a good brood included playlist too. Like I can go into the deep waters <laughs> with the playlist now. I, I pulled myself back because it was too scary to be like, no, like none of this is actually for you, right? Like this is not actually who you are. So yeah. the music helped me realize that like, not only do I love love, I love being touched, right? I'm a Taurus moon. I'm a Taurus moon and a Libra Venus thinking that I didn't like being touched and I didn't like sex and I didn't like love. And I didn't like any of this stuff. Like the music helped me realize that that was always there, but it needs space to grow sure. and it needs space to take up. And that's something that I think talking and being in, like having you as a friend, honestly, has helped me realize because like, even with friendships, like I love love and I love people who are in my life. Like, it's not just a romantic partner. Like if you are, if I consider you friend, you are family, right? And I love you. And like, that's a loyalty there. I that, love you too. Right. <laughs> Right. But there, and there's a love there because like, then I'm going to go to bed for you. Right. There is a way that mm -hmm. when I love you, like, I don't know how not to kill somebody for you. <laughs> like, <laughs> I really don't like, it's just, it's innate. So then you have to have this like really big discernment about how you, how you give it out and who you give it out to. Right? right. 
um, because it's, I realized that too, work, being honestly in community with y'all and listening to the podcast in the mornings. When I, so they'll send me podcasts on the mornings. I love it. I'll wake up and have like literally five different five minute voice notes from them. It's a whole ass podcast. Like I'm trying to get them to do their own damn podcast. They're hilarious together. Um, but it's also, I feel loved. Like I feel loved. I feel seen. I feel like someone cares about me outside of what I can do for them. Yes. Right. And that is something I didn't realize how much I needed so that I stopped literally choking myself off from my own love. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. I think that's a a big thing. And and I've told you about that, right? I was like, you pour into people so much. You have to have people pour into you. Right. And not as, oh, I got to go ahead and do this and coach it for me, but just love. Right. And that's the thing that I think I really miss in having those just confident relationships and especially being a baby gay. Like you do need to be coddled. Like I told you, you do need to be baby. Like, yeah. no, it's okay. You know? And that's the thing I do miss having a group of people like, Hey, just, just, to, you know, sometimes you just want to be in a space with somebody like, I don't want to talk. I just want to be in a space to have comfort. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important. And I think that like, we always talk about, we call it was a non-romantic lesbian relationships. Mm-hmm. Right. So like this be heterosex people, intimacy amongst women, mm-hmm. you know, you think about it, that's something that we really have to work on because some of us grew up in households where our mother told you, don't bring no woman to your house, right? Yes. Don't leave no woman around your man, yada, yada, yada. And I think that intimacy, that is what, and honestly, that's what I learned. And that's my gift to you. You about to get me really weepy, mm-hmm. but my gift to you is that when I came over into the life and for the new kids, the life means gay, gay community in the life, life, right? When I came into the life, right, my, the majority of my lesbian friends, and mind you, because I'm a pioneer, I was on the internet meeting people and they thought it was crazy. They were real friends. They held me down. Like there would be times I was supposed to break up with somebody, like I ain't going, we still about to be together. They say, it's okay, girl. Like to have people love you without conditions. Like when you've called me before and be like, oh my God, this feels crazy. I feel this, it's okay. And that you need that type of love because unfortunately we don't always get that from our biological families, right? We sometimes don't get it from friends we grew up with, right? We have to be very real about that. that Sometimes we are friends because of geography and condition, but like a real friend that's like, I got you, you know? And that's the thing I, I think of my friends, and, you know, Chris has met a lot of them, you know, including you, they love me. They love me. And also, I love that about Krista. She knows that I love them, right? And sometimes I can say this, you know, it can be tricky with lesbians and friends. It can be very tricky because it's intimate. Think about it. we can't ha- We can't get pregnant. Let's talk about that, okay? So we're intimate. We have so much intimacy, but also with our non-romantic friends, we have so much intimacy. And if people are insecure, that could be an issue. But my thing is that we're all looking for love. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, it does make complete sense. And I think that is for me why I consider love an element and why it's so much powerful. It's like fire. Because when you are when you can bring that kind of intimacy into a space, right? Like into a room, into a friendship, into a re- any kind of relationship. It's almost like it, it it literally burns off any ability to then bring this rigid ass way of being in. There's no space for rigidity then, right? Because it, it all it is is flow in it, right? And I think that's what the essence of queerness is that I that that I, I find can get really lost when we don't understand why there was so many different specific locations just for certain communities, right? Because it was a space to be able to engage and practice that type of love. And it's just not to romanticize it. I'm not saying all these spaces were, you know, always great, but I'm saying that it provided space to just be and just be fucking human, right? To figure it out. And it's messy and it's and it's really intense, right? When you love somebody, but also between two women, Right. And and I mean, women in general, like if you identify as a woman living another woman, right, there is a way that it is. We don't understand it because we're so patriarchal that we we don't understand that you can have that kind of almost entanglement, not Jada Pickett speaking, not Jada's entanglement, but like, <laughs> like this entanglement of, of bodies and souls that you can truly get lost in. Like time becomes completely You can. Lost. Yes. Uh, Chris said the merge, like they talked about in the L word, yes, right? It's just, you know, or the U-Haul phenomenon. Like 
there is an intensity. So like I can talk about for us in our, you know, early twenties, I think, was you still going to grad school? Cause you, that was in like, late, late twenties, mid to late twenties in grad school. Yeah. You were. Yeah. So wasn't nothing happening then for real. Grad school. Yeah. For me, for me, I met my, I met my first girlfriend. We were talking just a long story, but you know, we was together, but like, when I had girlfriends, meeting them, going on a date and not going home. It's a very real thing, right? And just being together and just knowing that you're going to be together. But also being with someone and knowing that on a spiritual level that you're connected, it can sound very like woo-woo, but it's very true that you don't want to get out of bed, that you just feel entangled. Like me and Chris talked about you falling in love, like you are entangled in bodies of puzzles and it don't matter. Like, mm-hmm. I remember not going to work. I was like, I'm not, mo- I'm nah, I can't even go to work. Can't even do it. Right. Just feeling just so like, this is, this is like that. That sometimes it feel like this is what my body feels like. Like I'm levitating. Mm-hmm. Like what? And like, you know, even as you navigate your own internalized uh, homophobia, right? And just understand the joy and the connectivity and the assuredness and being in a secure relationship. It is because again, we connect on a different wavelength. We connect on a different level, you know? And I think that's the thing. Um, And also the vulnerability, you know? I think there's a different level of vulnerability that, occurs and it goes back to your original question at the beginning that's why it's scary right and also there's no you know when i was dating dudes i i hung out with my my dude and his friends you know i was with them a lot because they liked me but a lot of times don't know i'm not trying to speak as an expert but a lot of times people have sexual relationships the dude hangs out this football the woman does her thing they have their separate time with us we're together everywhere we are doing all the things. We're doing therapy. We're doing cooking. We are, it's like we don't have a delineation of our life. And that makes it much more intense because that person becomes everything. And that can be also a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think the intensity is also amplified when you grow up thinking like, I will never have love. I will never be able to be me and oh, have yeah. a partner that is like, going to love me the same way that I want to be loved. So when you find that and you jump in and you're all in, it's like really fucking intense. <laughs> Did we, we talked about that though, too. That's also a thing too, Nicole. Like we grew up in a time where this was not a given. Even us sitting here talking to you like comfortable, it wasn't a given right. that we could live together, that we could have kids, that we could oh, hold hands, man. that I could take you to work, that I can mention you. Like, it was danger and it was dangerous. Yeah. Like it was not, it's muscle memory, right? Sometimes the trauma is muscle memory where it's like, oh. And so when I see the, the little kids do it, I'm like, damn, that's like, you're a prom together? That's just crazy. Yeah. And not in a bad way, but like, wow, because there was danger. Mm-hmm. There was literal danger. Mm-hmm. So like, did you see yourself like how you are now, right? Mm-hmm. We always talk about young Crystal. Did you ever see yourself here in this place of comfort and, you know, just you, everything as a, you know, as a lesbian. Hells no. I mean, I, I remember being in a history class at Wellesley. We grew up in the, de- the DOMA era, like yeah. don't ask, don't tell defense of marriage. Yes. So as much as I think we've gone over to the other side where it's like marriage is everything, you know, I, I'm not in that camp, but for us growing up, it was like marriage is not even a possibility. And there is no value put on same-sex relationships. People were getting their children taken away if they were a lesbian or gay. They were, you know, losing their jobs. And it was just normal, you know? Uh, So there is a certain um, way in which, well, you know, going back to being at Wellesley in in my history class, the professor asked us, how many people are going to get married? And everybody in the class raised their hand except for me. Like, it was literally not in my mindset I could not accept in my worldview that there was a place where I could get married so no I mean so that's the the that's couple great. piece oh sorry <laughs> Go ahead. that's the, the couple piece that that has really transformed a lot for me is like I can actually have a partner I thought the only way I'd be able to have a partner was if I was a basketball coach you know and, and still then like I had no idea what that would look like I didn't see it as being, you know, we'd be out and have a community. It was sort of like. Or that we did not have designated 
places we can live, right? Yeah. You know, I think before I moved to Atlanta, I grappled with going to New York, of course, right? My Uncle Daggett, who was gay, went to New York. And at that time, that's where people went. So Atlanta was, like, very undiscovered then. But, like, even now, you see representation everywhere. Mm. Um, everywhere. And even though it's conservative. So that, too, mm. is a thing. It's just, it is, it's it's very shocking. And the thing we always remind ourselves, going back to this archive, is, and it's really important for people to understand this, there are people that they couldn't even say these words out loud. Mm. They didn't even dare mention it, okay? Yeah. They didn't even document it. Like, they, like, they, it wasn't, it, it was so impossible, incredibly possible for them to understand. And you have people who are just like, that doesn't matter. But, like, this uh, being ahistorical is kind of crazy to me because, like, there were really big costs. We think about institutionalization. They used to put people in the mental ward for being gay. It wasn't that long ago. Right. Right? We just saw a video. We saw a video on TikTok. The girl getting kicked out because she said she's lesbian. Her mm-hmm. mother like, you better come here. So, yeah, it's, it's, that is always a reminder of me. And I try, the part of being freedom is like, I know there are people that could not. We talk about this in our ancestor practice that we know we have ancestors that could not and did not. Mm-hmm. They wanted to. Yeah. But they was like, I'm about to go over here and just die by myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And I think this is actually part of the gay curriculum, right? And why I wanted y'all to come on, and I hope you can come on again in the future, is that we have to tell the stories, right, in the archives, because the memories are kept purposely short and narrowed, right? And we get on these kind of these kind of historical loops of conversations that keep coming back over and over again. But when we don't have any kind of cultural, pop cultural, historical kind of conversation where we are now is based is literally off the backs of people who dare to dream, right? Who dare to actually dream of just being free in the public. And we take that for granted because even representation, we may have representation, I'll be honest, y'all, especially as, a, as an older gay coming out, we have representation <laughs> of queer folks, right? But is it really representation of, 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 of queerness or is it just a way that queer identities have been reappropriated through another consumerism, right? Another heteronormative consumerism, because I, I'll be honest, like, I, I, I'm i glad I came out later. I, I talked to you about this, Tina. I'm glad I came out later in some respect, because the way that the the kind of boxes and the need to label oneself and say what you are, but also not realize there's going to be fluid, fluidity in that, to me, just feels so much like heteronormativity again, because I just left a 15-year relationship with a man, right? Like, and so I just think that part of the way we coming out requires us to remember where we came from, you know, and we have That's to have these stories. We have to have people like y'all talking about what it was like and how it has changed, but also like, what does it mean to continuously come out into oneself as well? So let's wrap this up, y'all. So to folks listening, we talked about a lot of different things. But the biggest thing was that we're always coming out, right? We're always having Mm -hmm. to learn. And part of this coming out process is understanding that we need to talk with those who came before us, whatever that means. And so we're talking about time and age, but it's not just biological time and age, right? It's really about experiences and timing of life. So as educators, what would be a short little lesson plan that you would give folks who are on their coming out process what's uh and why this let's give a let's give a a a movie a show and a a song or album right what's a little three-part curriculum that y'all would put together on the fly for folks to engage with that they want to really get into this thing called queerness (laughs) i mean it brings me back to the music i listened to when i was in my college years I think, you know, Tracy Chapman, for example, was like one of my favorite uh, that talk about a revolution album. Um, And I guess um, TV shows or movies. I'll jump in. I would say uh, for music, I would listen to uh, Michelle Dickel's album, Bitter. Uh, comfort woman and cookie Mm -hmm. of course i I, I agree with you three-part piece Mm -hmm. um for representation i would say watch both bet plus the love tale the tv series Mm -hmm. as well as the original movie which came out in 2004 
and I would say uh, with books, uh, one of my favorite anthologies, if you can find it, is Does Your Mama Know? You know, I shared that with you, Nicole. Um, and then I would say uh, a second part of that would be um, this book I'm reading now is Memory Serves, which talks about gay men and memory, but I think it's very connected to just queer communities in general and why we have to kind of preserve all the things that we need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What was that book that we read about AIDS in the 90s and 80s? Yeah. Oh, that one. It's that a was, big collection. Yeah, it was really, really good. Yeah. But I would just say, you know, reading, um, reading is really, really important. And to look for, you know, like Poe's, I think Poe's a great example to show the historical. Yeah. Uh, there was a whole nother experience um, of queer life in the 90s and 2000s. So I think it was Jules. You don't have any of those movies you watch in the 90s. You thought we- oh, Black Mirror San Jun- Junipero. Watch it, Nicole, and everybody else. <laughs> if you have it, okay? Watch it. It is a vibe. It is connected. Yeah. You're right, Nicole? But yeah, I'm okay. Sorry, y'all. Like, it's something I got stuck in my throat. But yes. And you know, something I want to add on to this, something that I was really uh, happy about, L Word, we're going to talk about it in a whole other episode, because I have a whole lot of thoughts on L Word. But one thing that was really interesting was that we forget that the same conversations we're having right now, especially about anti-war, right, the state, um, rights and stuff, you see that in the L Word when we're talking about the Iraq war. Was it season three or four with Bed at the university, Mm -hmm. right? It was very, so their politics is embedded always in within queer stories because you can't yeah. separate the two. And so it gives us these kind of time capsules and archives to know that the conversations we're having right now, y'all, are not new, especially anti-war, anti-imperialism, being anti-state, right? People protesting, burning things, asking and demanding that the state right, take responsibility for its, for its war crimes. We've been in this loop before. So I yeah. think that when we go back in the archive, especially pop culture, like you're saying, and like Albright in the show notes, y'all, um, the things that Tina and Krista recommended. But it's really important to go back into those pop archives, um, even early reality TV, because early reality yes. TV actually was reality. <laughs> and you saw, people didn't know what the hell they were doing. The so real you world. saw some things, right? Like Pedro with AIDS and queerness, right? And your fa- gayness in your face, right? talking about race and racism with the first real world with Kevin on the streets of New York. Like there's ways that we can see that the conversations culturally were always there, but then the yeah. then the state comes in and tells you that, no, it wasn't. You have to just keep conforming. But also one beautiful thing about, uh, I would say pop culture pre 214 was is unedited, right? There wasn't counter culture officially. So people didn't go on thinking about sound bites. Cause even now as I'm here, I'm like, what needs to be here removed, right? There wasn't. It was just the raw it was. pieces of this is what is and the reality of it. And I think that that is important um, to note that in the formation of identity, we got to be able to express it in ways where it's not modified, yeah. you know, and we got to be able to learn from our mistakes. And I use mistakes not as a punitive thing, but like I see that people, they want everything to be Picture perfect. Going back to what you said about RuPaul Drag Race. Girl, y'all need to learn how to sew. Mm-hmm. Why do y'all not know how to sew, right? But also that everything doesn't have to be camera ready. That's how we learn. Yeah. That's how we learn. And I feel like what people's identities, I'm coming out. I'm just like this. I'm going to be a stud. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. Baby, you might wake up tomorrow and want to be something else. You yeah. understand what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I, I think do. that's the thing people feel very committed and like you're going to go through so many changes in general and you should allow yourself to be free mm-hmm. yes so then let's l- last question y'all um that i've been doing with a lot of my guests this season is what does what does freedom sound like to y'all what are the soundscapes that's a hard question um, it's twin it's fine um i think freedom for me it sounds like, ironically, sounds to escape the silence and peace. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I'm an introvert, and for me, freedom is not answering to labor, not asking for anyone's stuff. Like, you know, I always tell Crystal one thing I love about her is, 
that I both feel like we're in love and I feel free with her. Um, and so it's just the silence, the silence of not having people pulling me, ask me for stuff, mm. just silence, just to be able to sit there and hear my heartbeat. I think definitely as black girls, we always feel the need, the call, or even our inner voices, like, get it. You got to do something, you got to do something. So silence, that is, that is a, that's a freedom scape for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's such a good answer. Yeah. I think for me, it's mm, letting myself sing and learning mm -hmm. to play music and not feeling like I have to be good at it. You know, I learned how to play ukulele and I started playing a lot and I was at first like, Oh, this is so corny. <laughs> I play the ukulele, but I felt a lot of freedom with it, singing and playing and going to a coffee shop with 80 people and playing some music on a Wednesday night. Like that is freeing. I felt it, it was freeing in my body and, and, and just singing and not worrying about what people who, who's judging me or how I sound, you know, it's just, just being able to express those moments of joy and not feel so restrained. Oh, that's lovely. Thank y'all. Thank you. All right, y'all. So we're going to end this. It's been a bit of a, a longer conversation, but you know how I do with people. We like to talk <laughs> and get things out. Um, but you know, you know what? I'm probably going to have y'all come back on again later on because I want to really talk about the L word itself and the kind okay. of cultural moment as like a cultural um, time capsule, right? We can break it down all kinds of ways from the obsession of skinniness to, to the whiteness, to the class, to the to the war, to the to the sex, all that and stuff, right? So let's talk about that next time. Um, but I want to thank you all for joining. And as always, y'all, um, be on the lookout for um, the ne next episodes in which I'll be talking with other guests. We're going to be talking, breaking down Ifa, talking about the place of queerness and womanhood within these kind of ATR spaces and what it would look like if we were leading with more women and queer folks doing so. So check out that next time. And as always, keep dreaming, keep exploring, because it's through the dreamscapes that you can make your dreams come into reality. Till next time. Bye. Bye.